virtual box too. Yeah, you do need a virtual box to, to get some code there. So who has downloaded the thing? Yay. Uh, right now it's for sure on 2014. If you go to 2014 and you scroll down to July 14th, you see Seismo Tutorial 2 and there should be a zip file right there. Now it's also on 16. Thank you, Dan. Is anyone horribly confused? So there are going to be two aspects of the tutorial. One is done in MATLAB, and that's the one that we used two years ago. The other one is... Uh, Yarun is going to talk to you about, and that one uses a virtual machine. So on the virtual machine, what's the name of the folder with that one? It's called, um, sorry. It's something called like CIDR tomographic, tomograph, tomography plotting, something like that. I'm not entirely sure. CIDR user. Yeah, well, for for the first half you won't, but then for the math from for the actual inversions you will. Who has MATLAB? Wow. Okay, so if you don't have MATLAB but would like to do a tutorial, find a buddy who has MATLAB. Seismology is always more fun in pairs. <laughs> So everybody has everything? Is everybody ready? Not really? OK.
So I want to show you um, basically two things. Uh, the second portion is on on a, is a tutorial that uh, I I got from from Vet and from uh, Mark Penning who wrote that two years ago for the during the previous um, or showed us during the previous uh, cider workshop. But I first want to show you uh, a script that I wrote that that may be helpful. Um, you know, in the next couple of weeks when you're looking at tomographic uh, models, if, if that's going to happen, especially, um, well, if you're going to look at tomographic models. So I wrote a script that basically takes uh, five models, or six, I can't remember, um, which you can use to simply cr uh, slice through it. So you can take cross-sections or maps, you can make cross-sections or maps of these models, and you can compare them. So they're all uniform, the same, the same use the same color scale, so you can directly compare all five. And so that's in the in the virtual box, and there's two codes there. Um, the two codes there. One is called uh, make uh, mkr mkcr underscore all, and make map mkmap underscore all, and those are the two scripts, the C shell scripts that you can run to um, on the command line to uh, to make a PDF to make a postscript. Sorry. Um, a PDF file, and then you can plot the PDF file with uh, preview or, or echo read or whatever you use. Okay, so I'm just going to run these, and then you'll, you'll see how it works. And so it doesn't should take too much time, but you can you can basically play with it. Excuse me. Yeah, it's on the it's on the desktop. And the folder should be called Tomo underscore plotting underscore cider. Is the folder empty? I'm not sure what you what you what's your problem, Ida? Open a, yeah, to open a terminal and then, then CD into the folder. Yeah. So let me just run let me just run the script and you get the idea of what you can do with it. So you just run it by typing the So yeah, just type in what I type in. So the, the, the command you, you run, the way you run it is you type in the script name, mkcr dot uh, underscore all. And then you um, yeah, th if you do the dot slash, I always do that because that makes you ex that explicitly say you're running it in a current directory. Okay. Yeah, you need the dot slash. That's better. Yeah. And then you give it a, a location. So let me just type one in. Uh, I put in Hawaii. Right there. So what I type in here is, 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 is essentially the, the location of the, of, the, of the slice that you're going to draw. So that's the location of the midpoint of the slice. You'll see that in a minute. So this will be Hawaii, 20 degrees north, 150 degrees west. And then the 30 is the azimuth in which you are directing the slice. Okay? And so these are the three variables that you can play with. So latitude, longitude. And uh, an azimuth, and there is a readme file in the directory that should explain all these things. So when you hit return, it will basically um, oh crap! It works on, on, on the, the virtual machine. Though. It works. So I don't know why. It's in my local. Uh, No, I was not running it in the right shell. So it's going to run. It's going to run four, or five programs. It's going to run the same thing five times for five different models. Yeah. I 
I can't hear you. So if you if you did if you run that routine you should have gotten a PDF file, which is called slice PDF slice dot PDF. Okay, if you get JPEG, then use JPEG. If you can open a JPEG. Okay, I get PDF, but that's what's that? Can we get the scripts? This they're in there. They should be in the. In the in the yeah, you get them later. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah I have sure. Does it work? Okay. Okay. So and that's what I want to show you. So you can actually <laughs> <laughs> you can make you can make slices. You can so you can slice through these different models, um, and then uh, you can talk about them. Yeah. So maybe I can I can we can look at these a little bit. Uh, see what the differences might be. If you learn something from, from Vets talk, maybe you can talk, maybe you can see why, why things might be different. It's actually a really difficult question I'm asking you to address, but, um, but let's, for example, look at the last model. It looks very empty in the lower mantle. Why would that be? It's, highly it's a highly damp model. It's also a model with, with very few data in the lower mantle. So if you have no data, you don't get a model, right? Anyway, these are, these are fairly typical differences between, between global scale models that you get. So, uh, and the differences are for all many, many different reasons. Uh, mostly, I would say mostly data coverage, but the other damping, regularization, all the things that Ved talked about, all the types of choices that you make to produce a model, it's all going to matter how, how, the, how the images will look like. Right? Yeah? So are they all for the most part using the same data? No. Uh, the last model in particular, the last model is actually a P-wave model, and it's only based on direct and surface, sorry, I think it's only direct P-waves. They might have some, some multi-pounds P waves, but not many. Uh, so this is mostly P model, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's only travel times. The other models are very similar in, in, in nature. The gypsum model is, is, uh, is uh, predominantly travel times. I think only travel times. Is that correct, Steve? That's only travel times. The other models are a combination of travel times, dispersion, uh, mode frequencies, mode splitting uh, observations, things like that. So you see differences. You see, for example, look at the LLSVPs. You can see sort of differences in their, maybe their, their detailed shape, maybe the extent that they rise into the mantle. Uh, some of them have maybe on the edge a plume-like structure, like this SEM model has it very clearly. Others don't have it at all. But these are very typical, typical differences. Yes. In the top model, in the top model, there is no vertical. There's no vertical, um, vertical. Uh, um, what do you call it? Vertical uh, smearing or vertical uh, regularization. I don't know what so these, these, these two. This one, this one, and this one are 
probably fairly similar in yeah. terms of their vertical smoothing. This one, I think, is uncorrelated. Yeah, the GEF, again, the GEF-4 model, I put it in there, I had it, I just had it, and it's, but it's a P model. Um, but it's, it's a very nice illustration of what happens if you have no data. You get no model, right? I mean, that's no surprise. It's Obayashi and, uh, yeah, the most recent model um, from Fukao, Obayashi, and Nolet, I think, is his third author. We can do another slice. I mean, if the, if you kind of like this. So yeah. Does anyone have a desired location? Yeah, location azimuth. Nigeria. I no, it's a good. It's probably a good place to try. West Africa is one of the least well resolved. So what is oh, the African plume? All right. Oh, sorry. I already did my. He did South Africa. I did my favorite slice. So. Uh, so here's your Eastern African slice. Um, see also the differences in amplitude. Some models are much weaker than others. So the top model is is a highly damped model. It's implicitly or ex explicitly looking for the, the the smallest perturbation from the standard model that you can that you can do. So you get you get in, you get therefore weaker models typically. Um, that's a good question. I, I actually here I yeah you might actually have a slightly different model for this because I I actually multiply this by a factor of two because the the P wave variations are typically uh, about twice as weak as the S wave variations. So I multiply this by a factor of two to correct for that. Yeah, well, why do you think it is Thorsten? Oh, sorry, got it off the screen. I think it's data coverage. I think this is a this is a particular particular slice that's reasonably well covered um, from this, you know, from from the. So you get similar data. You get similar data goes into the models. You get a similar model. I think if, bo if all the data set, all the models derive from the same data types, then you will get the same structure. And then one of many of the differences here is, is, is regularization, is damping, for example. So the top model is, is more damped than the other models. I think data wins. Isn't that what you said during lunch? Data always wins. Is that what you, I thought you said that? Yeah. But again, these are the, this is the character, right? I mean, you can you, we can talk about things. Are, are plumes split in half? Are plumes, you know, or, or, or if these things are super plumes or whatever you call these things, are, are these are these sort of breaks in the structure? Are they real? You know, this is the typical typical uh, variations among models that you'll see in in the mantle. So you really have to go down into the nitty-gritty of, of the inversions and of the choices that, that you make in order to, uh, into, in order to assess that. But we all agree there is something really big under Africa that's sticking up. Right? We all agree on that. In fact, you can see that in the data. There's, there's no surprise here. OK? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just a naive question. Do these all start with a 1D, like prem-like velocity structure? And is that why there's kind of a? I see there's a dashed line at 660. So dashed is that line is 660. Yeah, that's just a marker. That's just okay. to, 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 put, to arrange yourself. So yourself they over. don't have like a predisposition towards like, like stratif stratification, discontinuity at 660. Well, some models do have. Um, I'm not sure. This model, I think, has a split parameterization. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So this model, you might actually, the model itself is parameterized differently than the other models, where you actually have explicitly a, a break in the parameterization 660. Okay. So that might be, that's sort of the, the, the strong contrast that you see between right. above and, and, and through 660 might be an implicit regularization. Okay. As, 
that would call it. But Thanks. yeah. Most models start have start off with a with a with a one D model, but these these variations upon the one D models, the scale bar is is about a couple percent, two percent or so, one and a half percent, up to two percent. So the the variations upon of uh, upon these reference models is, is is typically on the order of a couple percent. So the starting model is not too critical. Okay. Can you put lot one one up through Nigeria? Nigeria. You have to tell me where Nigeria is. So if you go, I guess if we did like zero, zero, and then made the angle 90, it would go north-south. Is that right? East-west. So zero then. Zero, zero, zero. Oh, you want north-south? Yeah. Now you can spend a lot of time doing this. <laughs> so it's a dangerous thing to uh, begin. A <laughs> we should have ended with this. <laughs> What format are the input files in? Uh, if you wanted to add a different model, for example. Yeah. It, so I, I took the models that I, I, you know, I had a week time to do this. So I took the models that I already had. Um, I put them in in, an, in a parameterization I'm most useful, I'm most familiar with. But if you send me a, a, a box with lat longs and values, I can, I can do that. That's not a problem. Yeah. You have a model in mind? Yeah, no, it would be yeah. If you if 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 I have the, if I have a box of lat longs and, and depths and values, I can just put it all uh, together. It's no problem. Well, harmonics is that what you SPH is? Parameterized in Sherlock harmonics, but that's just the way I parameterize things. But So this is a very interesting, interesting slice, actually, because here you might actually see an artifact of, of the 660 parameterization. You see here a plume, or you see here something red sticking up in the mantle, and then sheared off by the 660. Okay. I would argue that it's probably not a real feature. It's probably something related to, uh, to the parameterization. Uh, well... Yeah, well, I mean. <laughs> yeah, this is th th this stuff here, you mean? Of course, you realize also that the, that, that the scale used here is a, it's a uniform color scale, so you're highly saturated on the upper mantle. So the, the variations in the variations between red and blue is is more than seven percent in the top hundred kilometers, where the plates are, and it's maybe only one or two percent in the, in, the, in the transition zone. So you you might see a continuous blue blue blob going from the surface to the 660, but by by far the, the strongest variations are in the in the in the top of the mantle. You can modify the, the, the you can modify the the, the 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 scale factor or the the tomographic scale that's in the script. But that and if you guys want to look at other tomographic models, Jessica nicely pointed out that Iris has an Earth model deposit repository <laughs> depository repository where you can look them up. I think it's like EMD, like Iris EMD. If you Google that, you'll find it. Okay, so we go to the tutorial. Yes. For this part, you will need to use MATLAB. Yeah. Oh, and in the MATLAB di um, directory, there's a single .m file called inverse tutorial. That's the only one you need. All the other ones are kind of helpers. Right. Like you only need inverse tutorial. That file contains everything. Who has located inverse tutorial.m? Okay, cool. Yay.
So the, so the problem that, that Vet and Mark Panning put up, uh, put together is basically this, the problem that, uh, that Vet talked about very late in the talk, where you had basically a grid, sort of a, a, two, a 2D grid of blocks along which you had rays um, or earthquakes and receivers uh, sampled by, by rays from, uh, well, by sampled by rays. So it's a two-dimensional problem. Okay, the, the problem is not a travel time, well, the problem, the problem is a travel time model, and it's basically uh, written out here in this equation. And so essentially it is, a, you're looking for variations in wave speed. In this case, you're looking at variations in surface wave, wave speed uh, across, a, across, a, um, across a, a surface. Okay, so the tomographic model itself, or the tomographic problem, is, is cast here. You're just looking for, you know, you, you're actually measuring delays or advances of, of the wavefront uh, from a source to receiver, and you, and you basically, uh, you know, write out the observed wave speed variation as an average along that ray path. So that's how you cast the, the, the forward problem. It's a very simple, simple way of, of casting it, and it's r cast here as a line integral, so it, it assumes that the waves essentially propagate along a line. So it's a ray theoretical, a ray theoretical um, uh, formulation. Okay, so if you go down that, uh, then you discretize the, the problem. So here you're making your first choice. Here you're making the choice of how you are parameterizing your Earth. Um, and so you're choosing here a number of blocks, m, a total of m blocks that are parameterizing the, 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 the area of, uh, through which the, the waves are propagating. Right? So that's your first regularization right there. Right? So you discretize, and then you can write out essentially here, here's your data vector on the left. These are your, the, the sensitivities, so basically your, 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 the, the, the length of the line segments that the waves go through the blocks. That's the G matrix, and this is the model matrix. That's the matrix M that summarizes all the wave speeds in, e in each individual block, right? So that's basically what Ved already talked about. Um, right, so there it is. So there's your problem, D is GM. That's, that's the discretized uh, inverse problem. Data vector is your sensitivity matrix times a model vector M. Oh, thanks. Okay, so let's go to the exercise. Um, so maybe you want to start because it takes a little bit, takes a minute or so to to actually load the data into into the into the into the uh, data into the data vector and the model vector. So you need to run the uh, the first block of inverse tutorial, and you have to um, so try to do that. I'll do that, the same thing, and then you have to make a choice of which data you want to load. So. Um, so when you do that, um, you'll notice in this file that there's a couple of lines that have two uh, percent symbols. Those lines uh, essentially define the beginning and the end of a kind of block of code. And you can run that section of code by typing control enter. So as long as you click inside there and then press control enter or Apple enter, you should be able to run that portion of the code. And then it'll ask you a bunch of questions which you have to answer in the command prompt. Yeah. Like, what is the block dimension? So we're going to divide up the Earth into little blocks. How big should those blocks be? And then what period you want to look at? And the period of 50 seconds is going to be sensitive to more shallow structure. A period of 150 seconds is going to be more sensitive to deeper structure. Yeah. So I'm going to run this. So you click on, that, on block one, and you type in Apple return or, or command return, right? depending on if you have a PC or, or Mac. So when you do that, It'll ask you first uh, the size of the block that you want to use. The smaller you do, the more model parameters you're going to have, the bigger your inverse problem is going to be. So I think five, is that right? That is a good number. Five is a good number for this. So when you're setting here five, you're basically telling already, you're telling the inverse problem to look for variations in wave speed in blocks that are five degrees by five degrees in, in size. It's roughly 500 by 500 kilometers on a spherical Earth, on, a, on an Earth surface. And that, 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 I don't know how many parameters it will give you, but this will give you plenty of parameters that makes the problem already fairly um, lengthy. 
So don't go below five. Oh, shoot. Okay, I'm sorry, I screwed it up. So you do this, so I do five. Uh, if you do 50 seconds, do type in zero, five, zero, otherwise it will give you a bug, it'll give you an error. I'm gonna use 100, I like 100. It's a nice number. The, uh, the central period, that's basically the reference wave speed of that particular wave. So I'm gonna look at a 100 second Rayleigh wave. The 100 second Rayleigh wave is predicted to propagate with a wave speed of zero, uh, four point something. And that, those numbers are? What is it about, 4.2? No. 4.28, those numbers are in the, uh, in in the, the green comments in the actual MATLAB tutorial. So for, yeah, for 100 seconds, it's 4.008. So that's the reference wave speed, that's the expected wave speed for a 100 second Rayleigh wave. So that's basically your, 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 the middle of your tomographic uh, color scale. Yeah. Prem or? I believe it's prem, but I think for 100 seconds, prem is seconds very good. Really, yeah. It's pretty good for most models, yeah. Okay, and then, um, so you do that. And then the, the, the third question, just type in one, that basically is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, uh, the way you actually are setting the, the, the data variance. So these, these, these data come from Joran Ekstrom, and he actually provides uncertainty estimates on the phase velocities that are kind of hidden from you. And if you use those, um, uh, you can use his estimates as they are, which would be like typing one, or you, if you type 10, you would make them 10 times bigger. Or if you write 0.1, you would make them 10 times smaller. So you can ex explore the variations in uh, the damping. Okay, but now I need your help. Because what's yep. this? Block. Block. Yes. Oh, I have to run it. Uh. How do you open it? How do you do that again? Hey, you want this thing? Has anyone gotten it to the point where it's actually like plotting things like it, not uh, like writing things as if it's working? Okay. Thank you, MATLAB, for updating. Okay, so in that in that case, you should. You should do a search. If you find this problem with Euler, the way to fix it is you fi do a find and replace inside that inverse tutorial for the word Euler and replace it by like Euler 2 or something. And then change the name of the MATLAB Euler.m file that's in that directory to Euler2.m. That should work. That was not the case in 2014. Sorry. So who has an Euler problem that needs to be solved? Whoa, okay. Who feels like they're completely lost and don't know how to start solving it? It's okay. You do? Okay, I'll come <laughs> over there. And then I'll go to you. And in the meantime, help each other. So I said, yeah. So do you guys get a map? Did everybody get this map or something like it?
So the map, the, the map basically tells you where, where you are having data. Where is the waves? Where are the waves propagating? Where they're not propagating? So it's a, it's a hit count map, and it tells you the density of of coverage on the Earth. So you see here a classic problem. Again, a problem that is very typical for tomographic problems is that you have highly variable coverage, highly variable variations in, um, or highly very strong variations in hit count across the Earth, right? So most earthquakes happen, most earthquakes occur in the Western Pacific, right? Most seismic stations are in the Northern Hemisphere. So most paths are in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, and most paths go from the Western Pacific either to Europe or North America, right? So you see that streak along the Circum Pacific. Well, that's if you ever fly from North America to Japan, this is how you fly. You're flying across the rim of the Pacific. And very few data in the Southern Hemisphere because waves just don't go there. Right? That's a log scale, what you see on the right. So it goes the, the, the scale goes from something like a couple thousand to a couple of ten or hundred. The clarification for this is go into sray.m. There's a single line where the word Euler appears. Change it to Euler2. And then there's a single .m file called Euler that's in that same directory with all the other ones. Change its name to dot, uh, Euler2, okay? And that'll solve the problem. But I'll go over there. I blame Mark. Yeah, and the other thing is make sure that your MATLAB is in the same directory as this script. It, otherwise, it won't know how to find all the subroutines. So if you're yeah, getting you something gotta, like block you problem or something like be, that, uh, that's that. But I see lots of nice plots on people's machines. Yeah, is this the is this the right path? Oh, okay. So you need to go. You, you need to find the path. I think That's it's bizarre. right there, where you are. Sorry, I have never. Seen where that you before. are actually are where you are running this thing. So you're. You uh, so you need to be able to. Yeah, you need to be in. in well, you need to be in the. You need to be in the path where. But I thought I had some weird issue. So Great, it's working. So so when it's done, it's gonna make this. Yeah. Yeah, Alex. Oh, uh, that that problem over there probably means that you are using, you don't have the right mapping toolbox. Oh, oh it's fine. Can I, can I see your map? That's weird. So. Yes, that's what you have to do. If MATLAB gives you an error message that says Bitmax is now called Flintmax, kill me, right? This is this is a really easy one. So when MATLAB gives you those, if you click where it says inverse tutorial at 190, no, 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 um, mgrid at 263. So if you click on that, replace the word bitmax with flintmax. This is a weird uh, MATLAB thing that MATLAB did. Once you do that, your plot will look beautiful. That won't prevent the plot from forming. It'll just be ugly. Once you do that, the plot will look nice. So when you, if you get a message that says bitmap has now been changed to flint, flintmax, you can click on at at 269 or whatever, the orange warning, if you click on it, it's going to take you exactly to the line where that word appears, and you can replace it. Did it work? But it seems like most of you don't have that problem. Anyone else stuck on Euler or running? Yes. And who has the map? Everybody has the map? Or many of you have the map? Okay, let me, let me wait for a couple more minutes. What's up? Because if we lose somebody right now, uh, right you'll never get back. So here, just go up here. That's my experience. You're not running it. In the, no, no. No, you want to rotate. Click X. 
the left left of there yeah. is that thing oh it doesn't work okay uh, this is in desktop so click on pillar you mean the type of data or the who made the data and then click on desktop so these are these data are Rayleigh waves so they're 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 waves that are that are rippling on the earth's surface it's like a wave if you throw a stone in the water you get this rippling on the on on the water surface that's exactly the same type of wave so the surface waves they they propagate horizontally for this particular period they probably s they have a skin depth so they they see the top they also see a little bit deeper of roughly a couple hundred kilometers so they see mostly the plates mostly so the lithosphere the so if you, go here, you'll see right. you know what the surface wave is right They only go, that's a short arc, so that's the minor arc Rayleigh wave. And you can tell that's the minor arc because you have coverage in the upper upper hemisphere. If you have the major arc, you will actually get lower hemisphere coverage. So f for tomography, it's important to actually use the major arc data as well, so the long way around the Earth, because that's the way to actually see the southern hemisphere. Yeah. Thanks for asking. It's good. Wow, this is a lot more complicated than I had envisioned, this whole tutorial. And then you go to Euler. Well, it shouldn't be open, I think. Oh, and you already changed the switch. So try running again the Euler tutorial code. Okay? So you have to make sure you're on the same grid. You guys have a map? You have a problem. If I run it, 4.08. Oh, you got to talk so to. If I, if I do this, oh, Vet, can you can you help? Yeah, out with yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the Flint Max bit max thing. Yeah. That's okay. So I think we should all program in C. But it doesn't give you an error message. It anymore. solves a lot of problems. Do you have but some kind of weird computer? No. I have probably a more recent version of MATLAB than most people are. You guys have a map? Well, I'm running 2015, I think. Are you, you, you bored, you're bored now? You want to go on? I can close my mail. Oh, cool. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. So, so that's typical hit count. Well, is it supposed to, like, when the first time I ran it, it, like, ran what? a bunch of... Looks like a sickle. Looks uh, like a Russian sickle, And once sickle, it right? figures it out and you're redoing the same thing, it won't recalculate. Oh, it's because it's it will thingy there. Okay, good. It's the Western. Western Pacific is ruled by the... Yeah. Why is it's not an anomaly. So this, have you explained to them what this map is? Though? Yeah, okay. I can do it again. Yeah, please do. So this map, so what is the map again? I'll go over it again. The map shows you hit count. It shows you where we are, where the waves have gone, no, 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 that's not right? So it's basically every block, basically in, for every block you count how many waves have gone through that particular block. Okay. So here are your five by five degree blocks. You can see the little squares. Those are the five by five degree blocks that we've chosen to use. And in the blue area, so for example, right here in Nigeria, I think it is. Well, it's actually the Atlantic Ocean, but zero zero that we use a cross section. There are only there are only about maybe 200 or 300 uh, waves going through that particular block. Whereas if you look at Japan or northern Japan. There are, there are thousands of waves going through that particular block. And that this is very typical for these types of data because you have most earthquakes, most earthquakes are, are, are most earthquakes occur in the Western Pacific. Most seismic stations are in the Northern Hemisphere, right? And if you're looking at the short arc, the short distance between um, earthquakes and receivers, you will basically propagate primarily in the Northern Hemisphere, not in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, but this bias, this variation in hit count, this is what's going to determine primarily variations in resolution. Okay, if you're going to look at tomographic maps, or you can do these checkerboard tests that we'll do in a minute, you'll see you can predict that the checkerboards will be recovered very well in the northern hemisphere, and not so well in the southern hemisphere because the hit count is just different. You also see very nicely that the hit count really has a sharp boundary sharp boundary within the Pacific itself. Okay, This boundary is essentially because you have earthquakes in the Tonga Fiji. We have lots of stations in North America. We have, we have fewer stations in Central or Southern South America. 
So you're seeing here this boundary right there is essentially telling you that all the stations are in northern, northern in, in North America, but not not in Central or South Southern South America. Okay. Shall we move on to block two? Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So who who has not produced that map, even if it's ugly? Sorry. <laughs> Sometimes it looks weird and distorted for some reason. You haven't? Why? It's old? Oh, slow. OK, OK. Who, someone back there also didn't. Oh, I see all the computational people don't know how to. <laughs> Since your chemists are awesome, it means we did it right. OK, I'm going, to, I'm going to click on block two and do command enter. So what we're going to do is we're going to do an inversion of the data, and we're going to make a model. And it's going to ask us how we want to, what, what, what do we want to do? Because we have to regularize the inversion. If we just do the inversion directly, we will get rubbish. We have to, uh, we have to add a priori constraints because it's an under, underdetermined under problem. We have not enough data to fully recover the wave speed variations on the Earth's surface for this particular wave. Okay? So I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a, a choice. And I would suggest that you follow me. I'm going to type here. Um, 0 0.1. And that basically means that a priori, we're going to look for a model where I'm going to assume that the variations in wave speeds is 0 0.1. Okay? So that's called a damping factor. I'm going, to, I'm going to push the model towards a solution where the variation in the model, in, 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 uh, in the model strength is at most 0 0.1. The smoothing, I'm going to turn that off for now. So we're not going to apply any, any regularization in terms of smoothness. So I'm going to set that number to be zero. So we're only going to apply norm damping. We're only, only going to apply a damping to the inversion, meaning that we're going to tell the inversion, look for any model that you like. It might be rough. It doesn't matter. But make it as small as you can. Make, make the, variations, the variations from the reference state, from the reference velocity that we set, 4.08, Make those variations as little as possible. Add variations to fit the data, but if you don't have to do anything, if there's no data you know, constraining a particular region, set the model to be the reference model. That's, that's called norm damping. So for now, we don't do smoothness. So we set that to be 0. Okay. And so it's going to calculate some covariance matrices. Oh, shit. So fucking tired, I'm not a mad lab guy. I really, I, I, you know, please. Yeah, I know. I made a mistake. It's my mistake. So I'm going to make this 0 0.1. Okay. Okay, so there you go. So there's my there's my model. Okay, so we made a tomographic map of wave speeds of 100 second period Rayleigh waves propagating along the Earth's surface, and we made that by 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 imposing the constraints. We made it using first of all blocks of five by five degrees, right? So that's your implicit regularization, as as Vet calls it. And then secondly, we had an, an, an explicit per, uh, um, regularization is that we, we applied some norm damping. We said to the inversion, don't worry about smoothness. Make it rough if you like, but keep the, ver the velocity variations within 0 0.1 or try to keep them within 0 0.1 kilometers per second. You didn't get the plot? So you may have to bl t click on... Oh, okay, click uh, on block three. Yeah. You may have to click on block three and then and then do command enter to get yeah. the picture. Your your rune merged his block two and three. Yeah, so I, first I you run block two, it does the calculation, and then you run block three and it does the plotting. Okay. Did that work? 
Good. Did it work? Yes. I'm so sorry. Oh, that one worked. Not no, really. Oh. <laughs> so what do we see here? Geologically or geophysically, what do we see? See the ridges, yeah. You see the continents, right? So the so these waves are sensitive to a hundred second Rayleigh wave is sensitive to the top 200 kilometers or so of the Earth surface. Most of the sensitivity is at the top, but there is sensitivity all the way down to about two three hundred kilometers. And so you see, therefore, if that's your sensitivity. You you see, therefore, the top 200 or 300 kilometers of the, of the Earth, right? You don't see LLSVPs with these data. If you want to use LL, if you want to look for LS, LLSVPs, don't use Rayleigh waves. You have to use a different data type, of course. You see what? The Japan high velocity anomaly. All right. Yeah, that's probably the oldest. That's probably the oldest ocean. So you probably see a little bit of ocean, ocean. Um, Ocean uh, thickening, the, the what they call it, the the age of the ocean as the age, as the lithosphere gets older, gets colder. So you typically see that in the uh, in the in the wave speed structure as well. So you see the ridges, and then you see the the, the 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 thickening of the lithosphere with increasing ocean age or plate age, right? Shall we try a different smoothness? So if we're going to reduce that, that, that if we were going to, so go, okay, let me go back to um, to my editor. Click on block two again, and then do again command command return. Okay, and it should ask you the same questions. Instead of 0 0.1, let's try 0 0.01. Okay, that means that we're going to look for variations in in wave speed that are going to be very small. We're going to prefer now models where the wave speed variations from the reference model are much smaller, right? Only 0 0.01. Okay, that means that you're really pushing the model to be close to the reference structure, right? So if you do that, so let's try that 0 0.01. That means that you that you increase the damping considerably. You're really damping the model. Um, to the reference structure. Again, use a smoothness of zero for now, so that we don't smooth the model, that we don't, yeah, smooth the model. Um, notice that the chi-square, I'm not sure if you pay attention there, but the chi-square here is, Seven. The chi square is seven. In my previous inversion, the chi square was, I think, it was about one. Yeah. So the chi square has gone up considerably. That means that your data fit is really worse. You're not fitting the data because you're telling the inversion, I don't care about fitting the data for now. I, d I just don't want you to move away from our reference structure. Right? We really want to be close to what we started with, which is the reference earth the reference velocity structure. And you see here now too that look at look at this map, and we can probably compare it to the previous previous one. Where's figure one? How oh, do you overwrite those? Well, I think you overwrite the figure. I thought we kept the old figures too. But what you see now is that you no longer see clearly the ridges. 
and you no longer see clearly the content structure. You really, and also look at the, the velocity variation. We used to have velocity perturbations of about 4% before in the previous map. Now we only have velocity perturbations of 0.5%, right? Very small. So we have a poor data fit, we have very small velocity variations, and we, only, and we have only velocity perturbations in very few places, okay? And that's damping, that's just the effect of damping. So the only places where you, you do get some structure is places where it really makes sense to add some perturbations because it really helps fitting the data. That is really worthwhile doing, but for the most part, uh, the inversion is perfectly happy doing nothing because you impose such a strong damping. You impose such a strong constraint on, well, you impose so much to the inversion to stay close to the reference structure. Dan, you had a question? What's that? Only the strongest velocity variations survive. Those make sense. Those make sense, but for the most part, the inversion doesn't want to do anything. You da you're damping it almost to the reference structure. Right? I wish you had the previous map too, but I don't know why. It you can you can see that that the areas where you do have structure are the areas where you had a lot of data. Yeah. So it's like your data is like polluting what you get because the only place where it's going to put anything is where a lot of data really asks for it. But the problem is that we have, you know, our, our density of data coverage isn't necessarily related to where we have interesting structures we're interested in. So you have to be careful when you damp. I'll do one more. I'll do one more just to, uh, for the sake of. So I'm running an inversion myself again with now a lower damping, just to see the contrast again. Chi square is 1.3, right? And here's your map. Oh, now the old map is back. So now we can compare the two maps. Low damping on the left, or high damping on the left, low damping on the right, right? So you see small variations in wave speed, and where you have variations in wave speed, only in the places where you have a lot of data. Here it makes sense to make changes, but for the most part, nothing changes. Whereas here, this is a relatively low damping model. So here you allow the inversion to be more, uh, to, to, to move away from the reference structure. And so if the data, if there is data, if there is sufficient data to tell you there must be a variation, there must be deviations from the reference structure, it will put those in, right? And you see also that the variations themselves are, are much higher because you damp less. Okay. Yeah, Steve. It's not. It's the color bar has yeah, changed bar sadly. Different. Yeah, the scale's different. Yeah. Sadly. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't see anything. I guess. Yeah. But yeah, this 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 ocean this this content this effect across the ocean basin basically from from low to high the, the fact that you have uh, you know higher wave speeds below or in the plates that are the oldest that's a very robust feature that the data really want you to to the, the data really want that so it's in the models. Okay. Yeah, I look again, I look also at the chi-square, right? So this is the data fit, right? This is the date, this tells you, this is a number of data fit. You like that number to be one, that tells you that you have a good balance between fitting the data and the errors in the data. That's, a, that's, that's basically what chi-square tells you. If your, data, if your chi-square is very high, it means that your, that, your, that your data fit is very, is poor compared to the errors in the data. There's really structure in the data that you're not, that is not represented by the model. So there is actually you're underfitting the model. You're underfitting the data, I'm sorry. The model is underfitting the data. But the reason is that you impose a model to stay close to the reference structure. You don't like those variations to be there. Okay, so let's run it again and let's add some smoothing to it. So I'm going back to this, uh, this block two of mine click on it and do command uh, command return. And what did I choose? Um, 
Yeah, I'm going to choose 0 0.1. So we have a norm damping. We, we tell the model to stay within 0 0.1 kilometers per second as, 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 as much as possible. We'll preference, preferably the models stay within a variation of 0 0.1 kilometers per second. And then we're going to also add a, 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 um, a um, what do you call it? A smoothing length scale to the to the inversion. So in the in the tutorial, there's this formula for the uh, for the covariance matrix, where you're applying essentially a smoothness by by applying a um, what do you call it? A um, well, it, it included is an exponential function where you, are, where you implicitly say that you are penalizing models where you have parameters or model model parameters that are over length, or if, you, if your velocity varia variations are, well, vary over a particular length scale. Okay. So if I, let me just put in a number here. What did I do? Let me try two. So if I put here two degrees, if I put here two, that means that I'm, I'm telling that block size over two is two. So I'm telling basically that the the smoothing length scale is two, deg two and a half degrees, roughly. Is that right? No, uh, I think it's two degrees. So I, the, the try block size over two was just like what you should try. Or you might want oh, to Oh, that's right, right, right. That's but it should be right. just in literally in yeah, degrees. degrees. So variations smaller than two degrees yeah. won't matter. Yeah. But the boxes themselves are bigger than two degrees. Yeah, right? five degrees, yeah. So yeah. I should probably should use a bigger number now. If you do 10 degrees, uh, then it's like averaging over two boxes. Yeah, kinda. let's do that. Let's do that. Then we do 10 degrees. But it always has an effect, so it's a yeah, little it tricky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you'll see the effect here in a minute. So what we now also tell is that you are trying to keep Variations. You're, you're penalizing variations over too short, too short length scales. So you're actually adding some smoothness to the to the to the inversion. Okay. It looks now. Okay. Right. So. You see, the, you see it visually, right? What happens? So we have the same norm damping, 0 0.2. Oh, that's 0 0.1. I'm sorry, but it should be about the same. But then the smoothness of 10 degrees. So it's basically a 10 degree. Think of it as a 10 degree spherical block, spherical cap that's basically averaging the wave speed variation. So it's not quite like it, but think of it that way. You're smoothing. You're averaging more across the Earth. So you get a much smoother, smoother model, right? Which one is better? Which model is better? Chi square wise, well, I would say they're almost pretty much the same. 1.3, 1.5, right? So that you, you fit the data equally well. So you have, two, you have two visually different models that fit the data well, fit, fit the data equally well. You can either have a nice smooth smooth structure or you can have blocky structure, right? So when you're interpreting, when you're seeing, an, when you're trying to interpret these two models, this might be, you might think here like a whole ridge that's all all screwed up by whatever. You have all these little blocks of of of, of high low high high low temperature variations. Well, a smooth model will do equally well, right? So this is again very typical. There are we're making a choice. We're either making a choice of, of a smooth model or a, a model that looks rougher. And it's it's just which one you like better. It's just actually just visual. They're, they fit the data equally well. Look at this structure here. This, look at the structure here in Nigeria again. This is the high, the Western African craton. It's pretty pronounced here. It doesn't really pop out so well here. I guess the way you can understand that is if you have structures that show up in one map but not in the other map, sometimes if like less data, if there's not that much data there, sure. then the norm damping will erase the structure, whereas the smoothing will just make it look longer wavelength. No. Sure. I mean, both are wrong, but in different ways. No. Okay.
So block four is a is a checkerboard test. Okay, so let's do a checkerboard test. So now we're basically saying, well, what is the recovery of a certain pattern um, by the data? So in, in fact, if the Earth is a checkerboard, which it isn't, but if it is, it's actually a really silly test because you're testing whether the Earth is a checkerboard, which is, I don't know. But it, we know it's not. But <laughs> what if the Earth is a checkerboard? What would you what would you see? Okay. What would you see? So, well, let's find out. So it asks us what sort of checkerboards we want to look at. What sort of what sort of wavelength of checkers do we want to look at? And that's 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 expressed as as a spherical harmonic. So I suggest that we try eight spherical harmonic eight, which is you know sine eight x over the Earth's surface, right? So it's a very small, very long wavelength structure. And so there it is. That's our degree eight checkerboard. And if this was the real Earth, then we would recover the thing in the bottom, the checkerboard in the bottom, right? Quick note, on yours, uh, that, that error map yeah. is going to appear below the other two resolution tests. There's oh. nothing wrong. That's the correct behavior. It's just the top two are the resolution uh, test, and the last one is the error map. Yeah. So in some sense, it would be like plotting the diagonal of the posterior model covariance matrix. Right. You got that? Uh, error is error literally map. the uncertainty on, on your model parameters. And because your model parameters are just 5 by 5 degree boxes, then the model uncertainty on that parameter tells you what the error is on the velocity in that box. So the blue means less error. And remember, it kind of mirrors that data distribution yeah. map, because yeah. data kind of controls the whole thing. Hang on, my wife's calling. Hello? Hey, Shanti. OK. Can you hide the key somewhere? The whole audience can listen in on our conversation, by the way. but. Uh, Oh, it's also recorded, by the way. So this will be uh, it's streaming it worldwide now. So tell me where you hide the key. Yeah, keep it unlocked. Everybody can come. There's beer in the fridge. How many beers? About s only two. Uh, okay, no beer for Jean-Paul. Okay, fine. All right. Bye. All right, so yeah. So your resolution, so degree eight, so what what do you see? Is it good? Is it bad? You mean you have like red and blue opposite? Yeah. Oh that's okay. Okay. Oh beautiful. So is resolution good or not? I mean what can you learn from this? This particular is your well. If the Earth is a checkerboard pattern, had a checkerboard pattern, this is what you get. But you can see the amplitudes are a little bit lower. You can't see it too clearly, but the amplitudes are lower. Well, that's what we impose. We we told the inversion. You know, keep 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 the variations in wave speed up to 0 0.1 ideally, and smooth things out. So average average the velocity variations a bit. Right. But overall, the pattern is reasonably well recovered. That tells you that. Well. You have to be very careful with these sort of tests, but it tells you that a degree eight type variations are probably can be reasonably well recovered by given the data data that the data that we have for this particular for this particular radio wave. Okay? So let's try to let's try to be optimistic and make this pattern a little bit shorter wavelength, okay? Um, so we run this again. And I'm going to make this now degree 12.
Here's degree 12. So shorter wavelength structures, still pretty good. But you may see something already that we saw in the, in the hit count map as well. You're seeing already starting that the, that the variations, that the recovery of the checkerboards is a little bit better in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. At least I can see it from where I'm standing. But. Right? I'm going to run it one more time, and I'm going to try. I'm going to try now degree 20. And so now you see that the whole thing falls apart. Right? There's a few checkers, a few checkers in the in the Central Pacific, in the sorry, in the Western Pacific. That is not too bad, perhaps, but overall, you just do not recover at all the pattern, right? If your maps um, look insane, as in like, you know, they're all white, and then maybe there's like three kind of red, white, red, and then the error map just looks green and maybe has a couple of things, that might indicate that um, the model, uh, prior model matrix that you put in had, for example, a long correlation length, and when the computer tried to invert it, that kind of a matrix actually has a very bad condition number, so it's a very unstable thing to invert. And so usually you can fix that by making your correlation length a little bit smaller, and then the inverse will be better behaved, and you'll have maps that look less like numerical errors. I'm going to try I'm going to try 16. I don't want to see if it's sort of I want to see that that pattern. Oh yeah, perfect. Yeah. I want to see the nice sort of you see now the northern hemisphere versus southern hemisphere variation. So this is very clearly uh yeah. where you're seeing you know the effect of data coverage. Data coverage is pretty good in the northern hemisphere. You somewhat get the pattern. It's not ideal, not 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 perfect, but much better than the Southern Hemisphere, right? Hey, Ved, do you want to do the SVD too, or do you want to? It's a bit. Uh, so um, uh, why don't we have a show of hands? There is a two other additional blocks within this tutorial. Depending on whether or not you want to play around with this more, or you're yeah. completely lost and not getting anything out of it, or you need more help, we can just leave those two for you to do when you're really feeling that urge and itch to do some tomography. Otherwise, we can just, because um, there's 10 minutes left, we can just. Uh, we could start from the beginning and do it one more time, if that's useful. I think it is, but. Who would like that? Who doesn't care? <laughs> I take it as everybody. Steve. I don't care. See? What are the next oh, they give you a suggestion. You want to do the next two blocks? Okay. All right. They well, are it's, in it's SVD. Yeah. Mapping the mod model null space. Kind of. Yeah, I like the SVD myself, but let's do it then. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, man. Yeah, at some point. Yeah, there's a block eight where I think you clean up the disk, right? So there's a final block that you can. But do you have to run it after you're completely done? Or? Um, it saves those things so it doesn't have to recompute them. But you can feel free to kill them, and then it'll just compute them every time. And by kill them, I mean delete them. Also, you should get a bigger computer. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do the uh, the the last. I'm going to do an SVD inversion. And so, 
you haven't really, Fred, you haven't really covered SVD very much, right? So the way I think of an SVD inversion is that you are you are essentially just choosing the number of model parameters that you want to uh, invert for. So think of a think of a tomographic model as a sum of so it's a model based so we have how many parameters? I'm not sure how many parameters we have. We have something like 1,600 model parameters, right? And so not ev not each. So think of think of a model as a sum of of um, think of a model as a sum of of models um, of 1,600 models. So that sum would represent then the tomographic model. Or think of it as a um, if you think of an of an of an of an eigenvalue problem. If you have a if you have a if you have a if you have a matrix a matrix that you can decompose in eigenvectors and eigenvalues, you can think of, of a model as a sum of eigenvectors of model space, right? with each with its weight, each with a weight, an eigenvalue that determines how much of that particular model vector is contributing to the final model. So with an SVD inversion, you can simply just truncate, you can choose a model based on the size of your, of your eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Okay, so let, let me just run one, and you'll see what, what, what's going to happen, what I mean by all of this. So what we're going to set is a, is a threshold. We can think of a model as a sum of eigenvectors, and eigen, weighted by the eigenvalues. Okay, the, eigen, the largest eigenvalue would be 1. That's how the model is, is normalized, or how the eigenvalues are normalized. And we can say, well, choose that model until you reach model vectors that are contributing to the models which have an eigenvalue lower than a particular threshold. Okay, so if I choose here, let's just choose here 0 0.05 for example, it's going to find now the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the model and it's going to sum up all the eigenvectors for which the eigenvalues are at least 0 0.05 of the maximum eigenvector, eigenvalue, right? So it's going to sum up all the models that have a, a more than a 5% significance to the final model. That's how I sort of look at the whole thing. This is a little bit of, this might actually take some time. How long does this take, uh, VET, for a five? For a five by five degree, that takes a bit of time, right, to get the SVD? Oh, yeah, the SVD just Oh, uh, oh crap. Oh, really? Yours is done? It's, it read a saved SVD. So how long did it take to run that one? Oh, you, you read a saved one. So what it'll do, once you run it once, it'll save them, and then it'll be super fast next time. But this was a saved one, so this is not necessarily 5 by 5. There's probably some warnings in the PDF not to do it on 5x5 five five or something. <laughs> It'll finish. It'll do it. But you can see that this is a computationally heavier approach, and therefore it's one that people use less often. So I use it on a 32,000 by 32,000 matrix vet. Takes nine days. Yeah. But then you have the whole thing. You have the whole decomposition. Yeah. Is yours on? Yeah, I have a crappy computer, man. It's like six years old. Has anyone's finished? Oh, good, good, good. Well, <laughs> I need a new Mac. You and Jonathan can go shopping together. And it does it plot it automatically? Okay. Block five will do the plotting. Yeah. So if you have it, then you just plot it uh, and look at it. And then the next exercise will be to actually increase this number. So you might make, make this 0 
if, you were, if you're ready for that. And you should see that your model should be different because you are cutting off the eigenvector sum or the, the decomposition earlier. Wow. You're still working too? Is yours done? Yeah, try try something with a different SVD number. So make it 0 0.2. Oh, the plotting is blo is a diff the block next to it, block six. Oh, yeah, I combine the blocks. So. You know which SVD routine I use? It was written by Gilbert in 1969 or something like that. And it's faster because it's faster than any other routine that I've tried. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. And if you look at the code, it's it's unreadable. It's like this block, Fortran block without any indentation. Just just. Uh, my computer's really slow. It might be memory problem. Yeah, I don't know. It's just that's why I did ten by ten all the time. So if you have it already, you may want to just try it again and then make this number zero point two and tell me what you see. Smoother. Right. Simpler, smoother. Why? Yeah. So the SVD decomposition, the smaller the eigenvalues, the less those really contribute to data fitting. Think of it that way. Right? The higher eigenvalue, the, the eigenvectors of the model, or the, yeah, the, the, those components of the model with the Huygen, associated with the Huygen eigenvalues, those are the ones that actually are fitting the data. The ones that have a lower eigenvalue mean are, are less important. They fit the data. They don't add much to the data misfit. Right, so the, the the more the the fewer you keep those extra components, the simpler your model will be, because those are the ones that matter to fitting the data. So it's a it's a similar way of of regularization, smoothing or or damping. You simply can just choose cut off the the eigenvalue decomposition, just choosing those components of the model that matter to the data fit, and those are usually because of a tomographic model, because you, you are your, your data are essentially integral. They have to provide integral constraints. You're, 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 you're measuring average wave speeds. The biggest components of the model are usually the long wavelength components because those, those matter to the, to the travel times. Which one has more artifacts? Yeah, you can get you can see like uh, ray pads essentially and and various other data coverage artifacts in an SVD inversion if you drop too many yeah. because the patterns that you're kind of adding in the SVD those patterns reflect the data sensitivity. Yeah. So they're it's not yeah they're artifacts but they're also they're also not right I mean it tells you that there is data from one point to the other that really wants a high velocity path. And so if you would actually do a resolution test on that on that particular structure, you might actually find elongation along that path. It is an artifact. It's probably not real. But um, but the data really wants that path to be fast. And so if you include that. OK, my computer is really slow. If you try that number to be instead of 0 0.2, try 0 0.5. And it should get smaller still, right, et cetera. What is the second block? That's the other block. Was there another block on this? After SVD? Because it's 330, but yeah. I think it's OK. Yeah. yeah um, well, it's 330, so as usual, time has interfered with seismology. But um, it looks like most of you got things to work. I apologize for some of the plotting issues. Um, 
Yeah, pl block seven was to plot the thing, and then you can do some resolution matrix tests with the SVD. And then block eight, if you kind of want to... Oh, no, yeah, cleanup doesn't doesn't remove those files. But the SVD files and some of the other ATA files or GTG files or whatever they're called, they can be quite large, like 500 megabytes, as Jonathan pointed out. So if you want, feel free to delete them. All that will require to replace them is to rerun the code once. So it's not a big deal. And thank you all for trying. Yeah, they're going to be saved in whatever directory you ran your MATLAB. And if you ran it successfully, it should have been the directory with the inverse tutorial. <laughs> so they're all going to stay there. They won't pollute around your computer just in that one place. They're in there. They should be in the. In the in yeah, you get them later, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah I have sure. Did it work? Okay. Okay. So and that's what I want to show you. So you can actually <laughs> you can make you can make slices. You can so you can slice through these different models um, and then uh, you can talk about them. So maybe I can I can we can look at these a little bit. Uh, and see what the differences might be. If you learn something from from Vet's talk, maybe you can talk. Maybe you can see why why things might be different. It's actually a really difficult question I'm asking you to address. But um, but let's for example look at the last model. It looks very empty in the lower mantle. Why would that be? It's highly damp. It's a highly damp model. It's also a model with, with very few data in the lower mantle. So if you have no data, you don't get a model. Right? Anyway, these are, these are fairly typical differences between, between global scale models that you get. So, uh, and the differences are for all many, many different reasons. Uh, mostly, I would say mostly data coverage, but the other damping, regularization, all the things that Ved talked about, all the types of choices that you make to produce a model, it's all going to matter how, how, the, how the images will look like. Right? Yeah? So are they all, for the most part, using the same data? No. Uh, the last model in particular, the last model is actually a P-Wave model, and it's only based on direct and surface, uh, sorry, I think it's only direct P-Waves. They might have some, some multi-pounds P-waves, but not many. Uh, so this is mostly P-model, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's only travel times. The other models are very similar in, in, in nature. The gypsum model is, is, uh, is uh, predominantly travel times. I think only travel times. Is that correct, Steve? That's only travel times. The other models are a combination of travel times, dispersion, uh, mode frequencies, mode splitting uh, observations, things like that. So you see differences. You see, for example, look at the LLSVPs. You can see sort of differences in their, maybe their, their detailed shape, maybe the extent that they rise into the mantle. Of the
So everybody has everything. Is everybody ready? Not really? OK. So I want to show you um, basically two things. Uh, the second portion is on on a, is a tutorial that uh, I I got from from Vet and from uh, Mark Penning who wrote that two years ago for the during the previous um, or showed us during the previous uh, cider workshop. But I first want to show you uh, a script that I wrote that that may be helpful. Um, you know, in the next couple of weeks when you're looking at tomographic uh, models, if, if that's going to happen, especially, um, well, if you're going to look at tomographic models. So I wrote a script that basically takes uh, five models, or six, I can't remember, um, which you can use to simply cr uh, slice through it. So you can take cross-sections or maps. You can make cross-sections or maps of these models, and you can compare them. So they're all uniform, the same, the same you use the same color scale, so you can directly compare all five. And so that's in the in the virtual box, and there's two codes there. Um, the two codes there. One is called uh, make uh, MKR, mkcr underscore all, and make map mkmap underscore all, and those are the two scripts, the C shell scripts that you can run to um, on the command line to uh, to make a PDF, to make a postscript. Sorry. Uh, a PDF file, and then you can plot the PDF file with uh, preview or, or echo read or whatever you use. Okay, so I'm just going to run these, and then you'll, you'll see how it works. And so it doesn't should take too much time, but you can you can basically play with it. Excuse me. Yeah, it's on the it's on the desktop. And the, the folder should be called Tomo underscore plotting underscore cider. Is the folder empty? I'm not sure what you what your what's your problem, Ida? Open a, yeah to open a terminal and then then CD into the folder. Yeah. So let me just run let me just run the script and you get the idea of what you can do with it. So you just run it by typing. The so yeah, just type in what I type in. So the the, the command you you run, the way you run it is you type in the script name mkcr dot uh, underscore all, and then you. Um, yeah, the, if you do the dot slash, I always do that because that makes you that explicitly say you're running it in a current directory. Okay. Yeah, you need the dot slash. That's better. Yeah. And then you give it a, a location. So let me just type one in. Uh, I put in Hawaii.
So who has downloaded the thing? Yay. Uh, right now it's for sure on 2014. If you go to 2014 and you scroll down to July 14th, you see Seismo Tutorial 2 and there should be a zip file right there. Now it's also on 16. Thank you, Dan. Is anyone horribly confused? So there are going to be two aspects of the tutorial. One is done in MATLAB. And that's the one that we used two years ago. The other one is uh, Yeroon is going to talk to you about. And that one uses a virtual machine. So on the virtual machine, what's the name of the folder with that one? It's, called, um, sorry. it's something called like CIDR. Tomographic, tomograph, tomography plotting, something like that. I'm not entirely sure. Cider user. user. Yeah. Well, for for the first half you won't, but then for the math from for the actual inversions you will. Who has MATLAB? Wow. Okay, so if you don't have MATLAB but would like to do a tutorial, find a buddy who has MATLAB. Seismology is always more fun in pairs. Right there. So what I type in here is is, is, is essentially the, the location of the of the of the slice that you're going to draw. So that's the location of the midpoint of the slice. You'll see that in a minute. So this will be Hawaii, 20 degrees north, 150 degrees west. And then the 30 is the azimuth in which you are directing the slice. Okay. And so these are the three variables that you can play with. So latitude, longitude. And uh, an azimuth, and there is a readme file in the directory that should explain all these things. So when you hit return, it will basically um, oh crap! It works on, on, on the, the virtual machine. Though. So I don't know why. It's in my local. Uh, No, I was not running it in the right shell. So it's going to run. It's going to run four, or five programs. It's going to run the same thing five times for five different models. Yeah. I can't hear you.
So if you if you did if you run that routine, you should have gotten a PDF file, which is called slice PDF slice dot PDF. Okay, if you get JPEG, then use JPEG. If you can open a JPEG. Yeah, you get a JPEG and a PDF. Okay, I get PDF, but that's what's that? Can we get the screens? Can we get the screens? 